Hello, and welcome to Magic is Real, a podcast focused on the fascinating world of near-death experiences, spirit communication, and all things metaphysical and spiritual. The mission of this project is to share messages of hope and inspiration with others, and to spread the word that death is only an illusion. Thank you for being here with an open heart and mind. I wish you peace, light, and love always. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Magic is Real. If you are a follower and a regular listener, there's been a short hiatus, and I'm so happy to be back today. And if you are new, this is Magic is Real. This is the podcast where we talk about spiritually transformative experiences, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, all things metaphysical and spiritual, focusing on spiritual journeys. And today I have with me Mark Ireland, and I'll tell you who he is, but first I just want to say hello to him. Hello, Mark Ireland. Thank you so much for being here today. Hey, hey Shannon. It's great to be here. Thanks. So great to have you. Uh, so Mark is here with a a really, a really incredible, profound story. Unfortunately, he is somebody who suffered the loss of a child, which is something that is completely unfathomable. Unfathomable. Mark comes from a very interesting background. His father was one of the most renowned mediums in the world. I'm, a, I'm, I'm venturing to say, I think that's right. His name was Richard Ireland. And, um, Really, I'm going to have Mark introduce himself, but Mark is the author of several books about the afterlife. I will have you tell me the, the titles of them. I know some of them are being um, coming out again, reprinted, uh, but he has become a researcher of the afterlife. He is also a chairman for helping parents heal. Did I get chairman right? Yeah, just board chairman. Um, board chairman. So, yeah, um, we have... Um... Elizabeth Boyson's the president of the organization. She and I co-founded it mm -hmm. more than a decade ago. And then Irene Vuvalidis is our vice president. So they run the day-to-day -day operations. And then I'm in charge of the board. And Brian Smith, who was one of your guests, he's on our board him. as well. Yeah. yeah, I love Brian. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I'm going to start the way that I start all of my interviews, which what it, it, which is to have you go back as far as you want to, whatever you're comfortable sharing about your background, how you grew up, what your spiritual beliefs may have been, especially growing up with um, a, a father who was a psychic medium. Did he call himself a psychic medium? I think back at that time, um, well, he was a minister in the spiritualist church and then later had his own non-denominational church. I think the, the word medium was it uses predominantly in secular circles. It was more of the psychic part. And even that was a bit, you know, you're not taken very seriously when you call yourself a psychic back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, but, you know, within the church, the word medium would be used. And I think the word psychic was used a lot because they were interchangeable. I think it's used more today to differentiate, you know, the whole idea that, you know, some mediums, some psychics, are mediums um, and psychics and others are just psychic. They aren't really mediums. It's a little tough to define that fine line because you don't, you can't always quantify exactly where the information is coming from, Right. you know? Um, so I think the thing is my dad had a wide range of abilities, um, but it was extremely accurate um, and could convey messages from spirit. So that's yeah. what I grew up with. That was kind of normal to me so i didn't have to be introduced to it later in life as as something you know and i'm more a little you know i'm i'm more balanced now in terms of right and left brain but i'd say i am more analytical and and uh, a little different that way than my dad where he he would be very on the extreme creative artistic side i've got some of that like i play guitar i write songs i've written books and all that but i'm also you know, in the, I have a day job still, and I'm in the business world, and I um, spend a lot of time looking at things through an analytical lens. So um, anyhow, that's kind of a long answer to your question. I love a long answer. I wonder if you know, I'm sure you do, but how he discovered his abilities. Didn't his, was there someone, his father or somebody else had the same ability? So um, did you read that somewhere? Did I, I later that? found out that his 
his, his grandmother had, you know, done things like reading tea leaves. Yeah. And my grandmother, his mother, later became a medium and did trance work. So, um, you know, it was through the lineage and that's through both sides because the grandmother I'm referencing was on his father's side. And maybe that's one reason he was so psychic as Julie Beichel of the Winbridge uh, Foundation, a research institute has, found, has uh, mentioned, you know, these things tend to go down family lines. There is a genetic com component to having the ability it appears. Um, but really, my grandmother told me she first saw the signs of this when he was only three years old. Uh, he would just say things that he would have no way of knowing uh, without, you know, visual stimuli, stimuli or somebody telling him something that turned out to be accurate. But the real breakout event happened when he was five years old. So my dad was born cross-eyed. And um, so they took him to the Columbus, Ohio Children's Hospital for corrective surgery at the age of five. And after the surgery was done, uh, they had his eyes cupped and bandaged and had him restrained in a bed um, so he wouldn't touch that. And a nurse came by and felt sorry for him and he, he prodded her into letting him out and she made him promise not to touch the bandages and he said that he would not. She went on her rounds, came back to see him, kept throwing a ball against the wall and catching it, thinking, oh my God, he's taking the bandages off, but he hadn't, which freaked her out even more. Yeah. And then she brought in some of the doctors to observe this and uh, and they all then tried different tests on him, like voice throwing, putting him in his bed, having one doctor at the foot of the bed and another at the door, but he always got it right in terms of who was standing in front of him. So uh, that was kind of the breakout event. And then, you know, there were other steps along the way. I think at age 12 or 13, I think it was at age 12, he actually saw somebody do what he would later do in life. He observed that and it was very touching because he got a message about a friend of his, a buddy of his who had recently died in a car accident, uh, including um, a secret code name they had for each other. Um, so that was kind of really spurred his interest. And then at age 13, he did his first demonstration um, in, in a group circle um, to a bunch of people. And then he felt like that was his coming out party because his father never really appreciated his ability and kind of chastised him for it. And they had a, not the best <laughs> relationship in the world as a result of that. His mother was much more on board, especially later on when she obviously started nurturing her own abilities. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'm always interested to see if people knew because when it's happening to you, you've explained this because I've watched a few uh, interviews with you about how it's telepathy. And we're gonna get into all of that, but I know that as a medium myself, I don't see spirit, some do. I don't see them standing behind you. I just say things I don't know where I got them. You know, I just know. And it's because they're basically telling me a story. And it comes with some visual, some words that I hear in, in my mind. And it's sometimes, and it comes with a feeling. A lot of times it'll be a chill or a physical, not pain, but just something where I know kind of what was going on with their body. So it's really interesting also that you said um, there seems to be a genetic component uh, for instance, when I, in my development, I've had to learn to put my brain into a different state, a meditative state. Mm -hmm. Some, I, it could be, I'm not a scientist, but theta state I know is one of them that where you can still your mind, pick up, receive information. And I, from what I understand, they've done brain scans on different mediums. And I, I know you'll talk about that because you wrote about it in your book, but uh, in your many writings, I, you know, about this topic, but um, because that's what you do is research whether, you know, the, uh, the validity, the validity of this stuff. So I did see several shows where they put brain, uh, sen what do you call them? Sensors, uh, on yeah. like sticky things. And yeah. they found that the medium's brains were in a constant state of meditation, even when they were yeah, performing. Mm -hmm. When they bring through a lot of information, it was kind of the opposite of what was expected because it's it's almost like no brain activity, yeah. minimum, you know, as opposed to a heightened brain activity, which it's kind of like say, get your brain out of the way. Is yeah. the way I, I look at it. Um, and it's interesting that it would have to come through the brain, but right now we're in physical bodies and that's yeah. our mode of operation. So the spiritual part of us, you know, is connected and all that, but we're still operating our 
consciousness is functioning through this brain at this current time. Absolutely. And I'm a big, I've trained myself over the last two years and it's actually brought me so much comfort and peace. I have really severe anxiety and I always have since I was a little kid and in therapy for it. And so my brain is always working, working, working constantly. And this has been the best thing for me to learn how to still my mind and just allow information to come in. So I'm so fascinated with the brain science of this. Um, so, but first I would love to talk about your son, Brandon. Start wherever you like. Um, Brandon um, was and is a great kid. Uh, growing up, just a real gentle kid, the type that would um, embrace kids that weren't popular or felt bad and um, befriend anyone and was very giving. Um, he was artistic. He, he played bass guitar. As he got older, he was really talented. He played in a, he actually started playing in a band with his instructor who had his own band. Um, and I think that would have continued if he hadn't passed. Um, he was good at math and he had expressed an interest in maybe pursuing a physics degree, which is kind of cool, um, especially when you think of the correlation between this and quantum physics, although no one can really say they know exactly how everything works, but there seems to be something going on there that's interesting and ties into some of these phenomena. Um, so Brandon, it was uh, January 10th, 2004. He was planning to go on a hike on the mountains behind our home in Scottsdale, Arizona that day. And um, we talked for a little bit and then I went into the other room and I, while I was sitting at my desk, I kind of felt this presence, you know, or like, like giving me a download, so to speak. This isn't something that would regularly happen. I didn't see anything. I just kind of felt something there and it felt kind of ominous in regard to Brandon and this hike. and. Yeah, I'm a worrying parent like anybody else, but this felt much stronger. But then I just talked myself out of it, although I did try and keep him from going or at least talked him out of going. But um, he ended up, you know, getting his buddies together and they said, oh, I said, Brian, please don't go today. And he goes, we're going, Dad, like stop worrying. And um, to make a long story short, he went on this multi hour hike um, and started having difficulties. In the meantime, my wife and I were across town and uh, I had left a note on the kitchen counter to have Brandon call me once he got back on my cell phone. And my phone rang, I thought, oh good, Brandon's calling. But it was actually my other son, Stephen, who was at work at the time. And Stephen had relayed to me that Brandon had been struggling on the mountain and the boys had spotty cell reception, but they needed help. So he had asked me to call one of the boys, which I did. And then um, I basically got the police to send a helicopter up there, you know, a medical helicopter. Um, I All I had been told was that Brandon was passing out. So uh, we flew across town as fast as we could get there. By the time I got up to the base of the mountain, there was just a horde of spectators and vehicles and a uh, fire truck ambulance and a chopper was uh, about to come down or it had come down. I can't remember now because it's been a while, but um, a short time after I introduced myself to one of the police officers there, he introduced me to um, um, someone who basically ended up telling us that Brandon had passed. And um, that was pretty low feeling at that point. And, um, shocking and disturbing and, and all those kinds of things. And uh, there's no way of explaining what it's like unless you go through it but it's, it's the toughest thing that I've ever had to deal with in my life. Um, but, you know, the, the one thing I did have going for me, um, a lot of folks have, you know, religious faith and so forth, and that's great if that works for them, um, but that typically requires blind faith. And I had what I felt like was more than that because of what I grew up with and what I'd observed, um, including like my dad giving very specific messages to people in the public uh, setting, you know, uh, with first and last names and all kinds of details about people who had passed and how well they were doing now and things like that. So by this point, my father had been gone uh, a, a number of years, but I had an uncle who was still around, uh, Uncle Robert, who had similar abilities to my dad, and I called him up. And he had asked me if he could do anything to help, and I just said, well, if you get anything, you know, that you could share, I'd really appreciate it. 
So it was a couple of days later, I was in the mortuary making arrangements and either he called me or I called him. I don't recall which it was, but um, we got on the phone. He said, Mark, I've been meaning to tell you something. And he says, you know, last night I tried to meditate and connect, but I really didn't get anything. But this morning I started my morning meditation. Your dad came to me. Now, one thing I was going to tell you that my dad and my uncle and their, their mediumship was pretty advanced and they actually saw spirit like through their eyes. So they would visually see spirit. So my uncle told me he had seen my dad. I asked him what he looked like. He goes, he looked like he had, you know, all along. I've seen him a few times since he had passed, but it had been quite a while. And he said, your dad wanted you to know that he was there for Brandon at the time Brandon transitioned. Um, uh, and that, you know, he, Brandon wanted you to know that you're the best parents he could have had, which is what we like to hear. But in addition to that, he gave me the cause of death and we didn't have that yet. And he said, Brandon's death was caused by a lack of oxygen that caused his heart to fail. Um, and a couple of days later, the physician conducting the autopsy called me and said that Brandon had suffered a uh, severe asthma attack that drove his blood oxygen level down to a point of causing cardiac arrest. So my uncle basically told me beforehand, um, and that was a, kind of the first step in this renewed journey that I had. Because even though I grew up with this, I really was down a different path. I was, uh, you know, I'd gotten a degree in college. I got married, had a couple kids, and then got into the business world and was really focused on the business side of things and achieving the career stuff and all that. And this really catapulted me back into my dad's field. And from there, um, you know, I went on my own journey and um, learned a lot of things and experienced a lot of things. And, and that's really what's captured in my first book, Soul Shift. Yeah. And that's a book I haven't had a chance to read, but am planning to because I hear so many people um, talk about their own either curiosity or opening up of their own abilities after the loss of a loved one. And it's not just a loved one, it's someone you were so close with, they always say, I can't, I can only imagine it. It's, I, I don't have children, but they always say losing a child is the worst pain. I mean, it, obviously your child is part of you yeah. and I can, and I can understand. It's also Suzanne Giesman, the uh, medium who had a similar journey of having lost her stepdaughter Right. And uh, that led her to, you want to connect with your, your people in spirit and, and, it, get, and it gives you hope, I'm sure. Uh, what was sort of the, amidst such profound grief, how long would you say it took to start kind of acting on, okay, what was in your mind the path or what was it that you specifically wanted to know or, or what were you looking for, I think? What was it that you were seeking? I guess connection and confirmation. Um, and I think, you know, it played a big role in our healing process. And that's part of the reason that I co-founded Helping Parents Heal because kind of discovered a path to healing that we wanted to share with some other folks who have been through this. Because some, some parents get in a deep, dark hole and they stay there forever or the rest of their lives for a very long time. Um, I think in my case, you know, I suffered immensely, you know, for I'd say at least a few days and then up to a couple of weeks, but as did my wife and my older son, Stephen. But I think we, re we recovered and were able to get to a point of some healing within even two weeks to a month, you know, we we're, we're, had really chipped away at it. So and part of that was going through this process. So, you know, the call to my uncle was probably the first thing. The second thing that I recall doing was I really wanted a direct connection. So I sat in a darkened room and I tried to meditate and I'm not a great meditator, but in this particular case, I was able to still my mind pretty well. And the room was pitch black. I think it was actually my closet because I wanted to make sure there was no light. And um, while I was sitting there, I saw like um, inside my mind's eye, clear as could be my son Brandon's face kind of scrolling by with a big smile on it. Um, and then I saw a cross with an oval loop on the top go by. And at the time I'd seen those, but I really didn't know what they were. So then I had to go do some research to find out that that was an onk. The onk is the oldest cross of human history. 
um, back to ancient Egypt. And the lower portion symbolizes physical life and the oval loop uh, symbolizes eternal life. So I think what I got there was a puzzle that I had to put together um, with a symbol that I didn't know. So that was being more analytical, that was more meaningful to me to be able to put that together. Um, and then after that, I'd say the next thing that really was kind of synchronistic was, I. so this happened in January. So February, I'm watching the uh, local news on the NBC affiliate, and lo and behold, they're running um, something about uh, mediumship testing going on at the University of Arizona. And um, they're featuring um, some footage from actual readings that were done in, in single blind conditions. And the medium was Alison Dubois, who later became famous because of the show Medium. And I was really impressed with not only the process, but the results that she was able to get, how specific she was, the kind of information, how healing it was for the folks. I just thought to myself, wow, I'd love to get a reading from her. I'd love to be in that lab. Little did I know both things were going to happen. It was just a matter of when. But ironically, the very next day, I get a call from a man named Jerry Tonser from Dallas, Texas, who was good friends with my father. And uh, Jerry says, hey, Mark, I know what you've been through. And I know someone who might be able to help you. Her name is Allison Dubois. And here's a phone number you can call to try and get, a, you know, get an appointment. So I figured that was beyond coincidence. And uh, <laughs> so I did get that reading later that year in August, I think, because she was so booked out. Even before the show Medium came out, she was really had a huge following. And then um, I ended up in that lab for a, a blind, a single blind test that was filmed for Discovery Channel, uh, February of 05, with uh, Lori Campbell, who's another outstanding medium. And anyone that wants to see that, there's about a two and a half minute clip of that that they can see on my website. There's a link to it under the media page of my website, which is markirelandauthor.com. Thank you for sharing that. And I definitely am going to look that up. Um, that That is, I just got chills. Uh, that's also means spirits with, with us right now, but it also um, is something that just the, the idea that I have in my head of synchronicity, when I thought about it, I got that chill. It's just, if you look for them, you'll see them. And if you, uh, you, some might write that off as coincidence, but you and I both know this was your path. At least I don't want to put words in your mouth, but obviously that particular synchronicity was meant to be because look at where it's led you. Um, and yeah, so at this, I love, I love hearing all of, all of that and also how you meditated and you were able to receive information and images what was the next step to, I suppose I want to ask, I know there's probably so much in there, uh, but I would love to hear the sort of the journey to writing your book. And in the process of telling that, I, I want everyone to read the book. So, um, but in the process of that, what does the book uh, talk about without giving too much away? Well, it, it covers a combination of things. You know, it starts out with the whole background on Brandon and what happened that day, and then how it kind of thrust me back into my father's field. Um, and then, you know, the, the Ankh experience, the, the, the thing with my uncle, probably in greater detail than I just explained. Um, then I go back to my dad's past. And I talk about how he was brought up and I talk about, you know, because a lot of you know, we live in a Christian culture in this country, and a lot of folks have a hang up about these sorts of things or fear about them. And it's really unreasonable. I think it comes down to them really not knowing the scripture very well, or the fact that, you know, there are contradictions in scripture too. And a lot of the admonitions about this are in the Old Testament, but they're in books like Leviticus or Deuteronomy that also tell you, okay, if you have a rebellious son, you need to take him to the next town and have him stoned to death. So I think Today, we wouldn't really look at that as the word of God. Maybe right. some people would, but um, but there are plenty of um, stories in scripture that talk positively about these things. In fact, Jesus talks to dead people in the story of the transfiguration, in three, which is in three different books of the Bible. Um, you have Jesus demonstrating clairvoyance, talking to a woman at a well um, in, in John. Uh, you have... Um, you just have a number of things. You have Paul talking about the gifts of the spirit, which when they're listed out are pretty much spirit communication. You know, he's talked about discernment, prophecy, all these kinds of things. And those are all the things that my dad did. 
So I talk about that because I want people to come into the book, regardless of their background, um, if they have a fear or hang up to, to take that into consideration. Right. So I cover that. I then also cover a really crazy direct uh, connection story. I don't want to give the whole thing away, but long story short, my wife saw our son through a peripheral vision and a friend who had borrowed one of Brandon's bass guitars the next day called without knowing about that and explained the exact same thing. So it was like meant to confirm it to me. You know, it's like, okay, this wasn't just her imagining this. This happened to somebody else, the same exact circumstances. So there's a chapter about that. Um, And then I had several other readings with some well-renowned people. And and so I kind of chronicle those. I also chronicle the Discovery Channel session that I had at the University of Arizona and what happened there. And the end of the book really kind of wraps up my findings, both uh, from the heart and analytically too, you know, like here's, here's the evidence um, and here's how many things lined up that were repeated that, that were the same thing said by all of the mediums um, or most of the mediums and, and all the accurate statements. And I did go into those readings with basically as shielded as I could be so they didn't really know who I was or much, if anything, about me, um, because I knew I wanted to have this, you know, I wanted to do this journey um, as pure as it could be. And then the book basically was just journaling the experiences as they happened and chronicling uh, this stuff. So that's how it came together. Initially, I'd actually, I think for the first month or so, or a couple months, I thought I needed something positive to do. So I want to write a book about my father, a biography. So I started doing that. And then I had hired a, an agent uh, um, editor out of New York City. And she, after reading the material, said, you know, Mark, um, you can write the book about your dad anytime. But I think this is really your book and your story to tell. So that's how it ended up going down that, that path. Yeah, that's thank you for sharing that. Um, I have so many questions. I'm trying to narrow them down. But one of the questions is, uh, I know that you are also are very intuitive. In fact, I asked you if you do mediumship work, and you did say that because your work is more journalistic, it would be a bit of a conflict of interest because it's hard to report objectively about something that you do. And your interest lies in the research and the um, the writing, which I so appreciate because as a medium, of course, I hear all the arguments. Um, you're talking to the dark, you're talking to uh, dark energies, which my question is always, if I'm talking to dark energies, why are they able to communicate me with me effortlessly, but the actual loving spirit who wants to connect with you can't get through? You know, why would the dark energy be able to get through to me, but the loving energy can't? Uh, and they may have answers for that about dimensions and, and whatever, but there's so many things I always say, I'm just going to say this story and then I'll ask you the question. Um, I The other day I posted something about the way that the spirit world works from what I understand. And I didn't mean for it to post to Facebook, but it did from Instagram. And it turned out it was a great opportunity because somebody wrote, sorry, I don't buy it. And, you know, of course, your first instinct is to go, you know, why are you, po- I don't even, why are you posting this? It's so rude. But then I just said, okay, it's one of those, what would Jesus do moments where I just said, well, let's have a discussion. I said, I am absolutely not interested in debating or trying to convert anyone. I'm sharing my truth. And I said, and I respect your truth. Uh, he said, well, I'm a person. And then he actually responded and said, well, I'm a person of faith. And I don't believe humans have the ability to do this. And I was like, well, that's fine. I, you know, you don't have to. I know that I give tons of readings and even I'm blown away every time I do it. And someone validates this really obscure information that I'm giving them. I even say to them, are you kidding me? How is this? I, I don't even know. I don't know. Um, it's not that I have any interest in converting anyone. I respect all paths. But I really hope that people can open their minds to it because I think it brings so much hope in a dark world for one thing. And I think it also can help us in so many ways. I'd actually love to hear what you think about that. Um, the exploration of the spirit world personally, has just helped me with my anxiety 
so much. I feel like I'm now I, I'm in this flow of and peace and contentment like I've never felt. So first of all, I'd love to hear your take um, on what is the benefit of of learning about this and how does it how does it benefit us as a whole or as individuals? Anything you'd like to sort of take well, it first off, that topic? <laughs> yeah. According to scripture, Jesus said, um, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And to me, good fruit is something that heals people and helps them. So why would a demon, an evil entity, help somebody? Right. What's their motivation? It, it's got to be from a higher level to help somebody and do good works um, and help them over the, you know, as opposed to somebody being despondent and taking their own life, which I have seen repeatedly and had people as recently as two weeks ago write me and say, before I read Soul Shift, I was going to take my own life. And I decided not to after reading that. So is that the work of the devil? I don't think so. Here's what's interesting. Like I was just saying, the, you know, the Bible is full of stories of these kinds of abilities and, and they're common. The problem is that people have been trained, church going people have been trained to believe that these things are reserved for a special period of time. It happened in the past. It'll happen again in the future um, during the second coming or some period like that. But the church claims there was a special dispensation of these abilities back then and in the future. But the reason they did that, and this is not in scripture where it says this, at least not to my knowledge, it's created by the church. And it was created because when the period of enlightenment happened, when science started basically fighting against religion because it had been so pierced, persecuted, going to like Galileo and so forth, um, discovering that the earth revolved around the sun, not the other way around. Um, actually, it wasn't him that discovered that, but that I can't remember for sure. But during that period of, en of enlightenment, science had pretty much had it. And so there was a backlash. And so they challenged the church and said, well, you know, your book talks about all these abilities, you know, um, prophecy and, um, you know, all these healing and, and all these things, but none of your leaders can do these things. Why is that? So the church created this theory of special dispensation, claiming, well, it happened then, it'll happen in the future. So that was just an out. The reality is these abilities have always been there and they will continue to be there. And people need to know that because I think it, it's a gift to us. It's part of who we are. And I think really it's built into humans too. Like if you were to go back thousands of years, probably during the period of cavemen, uh, cave women, <laughs> you know, maybe it was this intuition helped them not turn a corner and walk right into a, a dangerous situation or to know where to go to find food or things like this. So we've just shut this off, I think, over time, both through fear and also because of technology and distractions. So people are so into their phones. I mean, you go anywhere now, any event that's a live event and people are looking at their phones, so it's a live event. So, you know, it's just we're consumed with technology now and um, people don't know how to slow things down and listen to that subtle voice any longer. And I think that's our connection to God, to me. Thank you. I always, you said that exactly the way I always explain it, that you know, if someone says to me, well, I don't believe in that, I'll say, well, that's fine. But consider this, the sixth sense isn't magic. I mean, I think it's magical. And that's why <laughs> this podcast is called Magic is Real. But it's actually a survival mechanism. As you said, back in the day, we were part of a herd, we had to sense for danger. So and how does it how do dogs and cats know when there's an earthquake coming? Because they have to be prepared for danger because it's survival of the fittest. But as we evolved, we didn't need that sense as much because now I don't have to figure out which direction I'm going. I look at my GPS. Um, I don't. And as you said, we're not we're so busy all the time. There's all this, this stimulation. So we're not sitting with ourselves, which is why to be a medium, I spent every single day for the last two and a half years in meditation to retrain my brain to get out of that thinking mode and into the feeling mode. That's just nature. That's normal to me, I think. And I, you said it so well that it's actually one of our senses. We just don't, we take it for granted. And while I don't consider myself a medium um, and I'm not pursuing that right now, 
I think all of us have some level of ability. Um, I'll tell you a quick story for one of the more pronounced uh, things that happened to me um, that kind of show me I have the, uh, the, the ability in a latent way. And that is going back a few years, uh, Tina Powers is a good friend of mine. She's an outstanding medium in, in Tucson. She and I were going to this church in San Francisco each year, a spiritualist church to do, um, I would give a talk and she would do gallery readings for the congregation. And so this one particular time, it was, I think, 2015, 2016, beforehand, she said, Mark, I think you're going to get a message. Will you share it? And I said, well, sure, I'll be happy to share anything I get. And, and then she kept bugging me about it again and again, like, Mark, are you sure you'll share this? Yes, I will. Yes, I will. So this went on and on. And finally, it you know, comes to the weekend where we're doing this. And even on the Sunday, we're going to do our, um, our talk. We're walking in the door. She goes, Mark, if you get a message today, will you share it? I said, yes, Tina, I promise. So we go in and um, at that time, we're about 30 minutes early. And I went into the he healing room. So there's a healing room there where people are doing laying on of hands healing. And I'm just looking for a quiet place to sit and kind of prepare. So I sit down at the bench of either a piano or an organ and quietly try to meditate. And like the time of the onk, this time I was actually able to get a completely blank mind. It was unbelievable. I mean, it went completely blank. I never can get that. And while I was in that state, a name dropped in. I didn't see it and I didn't hear it and I didn't sense a presence, but the name was Max. And, I, and then immediately after I got Maxine, I thought, oh, maybe it's not Max, maybe it's Maxine. But that's all I got, I got nothing else. Now, this church had been founded by a woman named Florence Becker uh, in like, I think 1922, and she passed in like 1970 or thereabouts. Um, and she had abilities similar to my father's from all accounts I've heard. So um, anyhow, I go up to do my talk. And at the end, I said, you know, Tina made me promise that if I got anything, I'd share it. And I don't know if this means anything to anyone here, but I've got the names either Max or Maxine. Do those mean anything to anyone here? And the pastor, Dell, he looked at me and his jaw dropped. And he says, well, Max and Maxine were twins born to the church founder, Florence Becker. And I think we know who's here right now. Wow. So, and, and that to me kind of provided me with an illustration for like how subtle something so profound can be. So subtle that I might not even want to say it because it's not like, it wasn't like it was shouted from the rooftops. I didn't get a burning bush. I didn't see anybody just subtly those two names I could have questioned myself because yeah. it came in like an idea would come in or maybe a memory would come in just something like that and lo and behold you know it had a profound meaning to those folks there and then he, he after the service he took me upstairs and showed me uh, a painting a landscape painting that was made with a winding road and he said see those two little figures at the end of the road that's Max and Maxine oh. so um, anyhow that, that's kind of an extreme example. I, I've had more subtle ones, but I've, um, you know, to me that when I have those, it, it tells me what it's like maybe yeah. for, the, for a medium, although everybody has different types of abilities and how they see stuff or how they feel stuff. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm glad that you said that. I, I've been, recently my abilities have expanded tenfold and it's because I I've explained it this way. When I took, I was, I used to do CrossFit and they were trying to teach us how to do double unders, which is where the jump rope goes under your feet twice. You go, whew, 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 whew. and but it takes this coordination. And for a year, I'm like, I can't get this. I just can't get it. And then they're like, it's all in the wrists. I'm like, what do you mean? And then all of a sudden, my brain just got it. And I just could do them anytime, just easy from that moment on. And I said, it's been like that, even though I have I have so much farther I want to go with mediumship to become more precise, more consistent. But it's when I finally got the feeling of it, which is like, oh, okay, it's in the wrist. It's just right here. The way you described it is exactly it. It's, and I just started to, it doesn't always work perfectly because the spirit has, it has to be this energy exchange between you, me, and the spirit world. And there really, I've found has to be a need. I mean, at least some sort of a need. For the spirit to say, okay, I'm going to lower my vibration and come through, but it's what I've noticed and I've started to pay attention now. It's what it is, is it's your, and again, like you said, everyone receives it differently, but I feel like this is sort of it. 
it comes in as a subconscious thought. We're so too, we're so accustomed to just ignoring our subconscious thoughts. So we don't even know they're there. But when you practice every day, listening to your subconscious thoughts, I'm talking to you. I'm listening to you. I hear every word you're saying. I understand the meaning of what you're saying. Meanwhile, in the back of my mind, I'm seeing Charlie Brown and peanuts like, you know, and that actually just happened. And I'm not sure if that actually is relevant to you, but I, but I just, I, I do it consciously to see if there might be a message there. Um, and I start to go, well, while I'm hearing and looking, I'm also paying attention to this very subtle thought in the back of my mind. Like, why am I seeing Snoopy on the doghouse? And Charlie Brown. And sometimes it is just a subconscious thought, but the more you practice tuning into it, the more you, and you try it out with people and say, why am I seeing this thing? And they're like, because it means something to me. You realize it's that subtle, but once you get used to constantly paying attention to your background thoughts, it becomes easier and easier to get this. So that just in regard to what you just said, yeah. or just because it might be fun for you to hear this. Yeah. Um, my father-in-law who passed in 2015, we inherited his dachshund and that dachshund went in today to the animal clinic to have major stuff done to his teeth and mouth. And he just got home. So Aww. maybe that's Snoopy. I know. <laughs> Cause, I don't... Cause he was a dachshund. Oh, he was... oh, was he a dachshund? I think so. I don't oh, know. I don't know. We... It's I don't know dog. if he was, well, he's, oh, I don't know, but yeah. Thank you for sharing that though. I wonder maybe if he's it... something, maybe Snoopy something else, but I know it's a small more... dog. It felt more like Charlie Brown and seeing the zigzag on his shirt and the little coil on it. I just saw him very clearly. And then it took me to the dog house. And again, sometimes it's your own thought coming in, but I wouldn't have even ever, why am I thinking about peanuts or I'm not even thinking it. It's just dropping in. That's what's interesting. It's not that it doesn't feel the same as thinking. It feels like right. it's just someone. Why is that it, here? <laughs> why is that here? And uh, the other day I was talking to one of my friends who's a medium and all of a sudden I felt the presence of a spirit. I said, I think your friend is here. And I knew he'd lost a friend. And I said, I think it's this particular friend. And suddenly information just started coming through. And he was going, yes, yes, yes. Finished the reading, started to do yoga. And this image kept coming in so clearly. And it was like this woman, This I saw it. It was like a Mexican woman putting dark lip liner around her lips. And, and I thought, that's so random. I don't know what that is. I keep doing yoga. It comes in again. I'm like, I wonder if that has to do with my friend but it seems so out of left field and like, I don't even know what this is. So then I go to sleep, I wake up, it's there again. So I just texted him and said, okay, the image uh, is of like a chola, like she's putting, like she's drawing her eyebrows and she's drawing the lipstick. And he goes, I know what that is. That was a nickname I had for my friend. It has to do with a story that she used to, we used to joke about um, and it is very relevant. And it's, the kind of thing where I, you, you just think it's a fleeting thought, mm -hmm. but when you keep seeing it and you keep seeing it and you keep seeing it, you're like, this must be something. It's fascinating. What do you yeah. know about that from a researcher standpoint? Um, anything you'd like to, to share, really? Well, you know, one thing we didn't really talk about, I think in 2014, I started uh, a mediumship certification program. And the reason I did it was because after my books came out, I was just flooded with requests for readings. Well, who do I go see? Who's a good medium? And the people I knew primarily were celebrity mediums yeah. at that point. And they had long wait lists and they were expensive, typically not all, but they were, you know, not accessible to everyone. Let's just put it that way. So I saw, thought, you know, there are got to be more mediums out there that are just unknown that really have the ability. So um, I'm friends with Tricia Robertson, who's the uh, past president of the Scottish Society of Psychical Research. And I reached out to her for some direction. And I'd also um, knew Dr. Emily Williams Kelly of the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies. And that's where, you know, Dr. Bruce Grayson's yep. been and they've done all the reincarnation research to back to Dr. Ian Stevenson and so on. Um, but you know, I participated in an experiment with Dr. Kelly at one point and I found out what her protocols were. And I used similar protocols and then kind of fine tune them with feedback from Trisha Robertson. So what I do essentially is if a medium wants to be certified um, and get on the website so they can say, hey, I've gone through this process, but also some wanna be providers for helping parents heal. And if they do, they have to go through this first. But they do five blind readings, typically by Zoom. 
the sitter has to change their name profile, so it's just a first name, and they can't use video, um, at least in the beginning of it, for the, the testing portion. Um, and then the medium provides a reading, you know, and then it's recorded, the sitter transcribes it, and then grades if the statements are correct, incorrect, or indeterminable, or if they're correct and they deserve bonus points for something really over the top, really outstanding, you know. And then statistically, we, we grade those and you need a score of 70 to pass. Um, and there's, you know, so you could either have 70% correct and that would be a pass, or you could have 60, 65% correct, no less than 60% correct with, you get five points per bonus statement. So you'd have to have at least two bonus statements plus 60% correct. Um, and that's over a five reading deal. So um, that's, you know, what we've gone through and what I've observed aside from my own experiences and what I think it's like is just, um, I think some people see visuals more, they're, they're clairvoyant, some are clairaudient, and by clairaudient, there are very few that actually auditorily hear something. It's more like I described it earlier, where a name pops in or a word pops in, but they don't really hear it. Um, but in some cases they do, but it's pretty rare from what yeah. I've observed. Um, some of the mediums do it like you do, though, be able to look at you and then see something in the background kind of and like is it a screen or whatever now i haven't been able to do that for me to provide any visual imagery i have to shut my eyes so i don't know if that's just something i haven't have to practice or whatnot i think i get too distracted maybe or i just can't see it clearly unless my eyes are shut um so let's see and then feelings the clear sentience part of it um i've had that definitely um you know, I was doing a kind of a test session for somebody one time where I was serving as the medium just to test out my abilities. Yeah. And, and I felt like what it was like, uh, like what her husband who had died, who had drowned, came through with and this rush of emotion that just kind of flushed me with energy and actually made me start crying. Yeah, I've had that um, happen. So there's just a wide range of these kinds of things. And I think the more of them you have access to, the better you probably would be as a medium. Yeah. And I relate, I, I had to leave my eyes closed the whole time in the beginning. And now I was like, how can you not close your eyes? And now I've gotten to the point where I kind of just look to the side and I now can see the movie in my mind, but it does take a lot of practice. And that's so interesting. Um, that Yeah. Just so interesting the way it comes in. I'm very clairvoyant, but then as I've developed, now it comes along with, it's like, I see something and then I go, what does this mean? And then I start to feel more about what the symbol means. And when I hear names and it's right, it comes in differently. It's actually more subtle than you would think. It's more, um, sometimes it's the quietest voice. It's the one where it's like, Heather, <laughs> just this very faint thing. Um, like the other day I did a reading and I just went, first things I wrote down, Emily George Torty Cat. And he goes, my daughter's name is Emily. My father's name is George. And my, my wife in spirit had a torty cat. And I said, and that cat was her baby. He said, yep. So I heard names, but I saw clear as day, this torty cat, which is not a very common breed. And it's interesting how, but as it comes together, you start to learn how to use them all together. When I heard, saw peanuts and Charlie Brown, I wasn't really feeling anything with it, mm -hmm. which is my sign that eh, it probably isn't coming from spirit, but if I get that chill, I always get a chill on one side of my body when I hit on something. Not actually, not always, always, but that helps a lot. Um, that they give me this physical sensation of tingles all over my body to sort of say, "Yeah, yeah, you're on the right track. Keep going with that." Um, and so there's so many sensations, including one time I did a reading where I went, I said, oh, "Like I feel like all the air just got sucked out of my lungs." And she said, "Yeah, my mother had to have, she had a tube down her throat and they had to suck the fluid." I out of her lungs. That was kind of something that happened. So sometimes it's actually a physical, sometimes it's more of just an energy vibration that feels, yeah, there's a different, a shift in the energy or the temperature. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. I was um, going to ask if you had an, something to elaborate about that too. Well, I haven't had that kind of, you know, the feeling of, of, of um, a heart attack per se or whatever, yeah. but a lot of the mediums I work with would say they physically feel like a pain in their chest or like they felt something that felt like a, a crash or a gunshot or whatever. 
they didn't necessarily know exactly what it was, but they had a kind of a general explanation for what that felt like. Um, but I think in general, like we talked about earlier, you brought up telepathy. I think the most common definition of mediumship is telepathy with the deceased. Yeah. Um, so that is telepathically, you're getting information from them. And there's person to person telepathy. Living people can have a te telepathy as Duke University Parapsychology Lab discovered through doing countless tests. Telepathy is statistically proven no matter what the skeptics say, but it is. So um, telepathy with the discarnate seems to be the way that it works too to get that information. Now, then you could get people arguing like they may be open to psychic phenomena, but not mediumship. They're like, they might contend, hey, um, well, how do you know you're not just reading the mind of the sitter? Yeah. You know? So you'd have to explain that. And you can't really prove it 100%, but I think there are some different explanations that I've heard and I've written about in my books that make sense to me. You know, and one is a lot of mediums will describe the difference between a psychic reading and a mediumship reading uh, in terms of the intensity and mm -hmm. the feeling of a presence and volition, like there's a sense of volition, like somebody's trying to push something to get information. Um, I, an example of that is a medium, Deborah Martin, who's a good friend of mine. She lives in Scottsdale, Arizona. Now this goes back 10 years, but I got a call one morning while I was at work from a coworker in Sacramento whose brother had just died in a motorcycle accident. And she said she needed to talk to me because she needed my help because um, she knew I was already in this field and in, involved in this field and knew people. And I had an email her and say, hey, I'm tied up right now. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, and actually that day I was scheduled to go see Deborah because she had felt she had a connection with my father because I was about to publish his book, Your Psychic Potential, A Guide to Psychic Development. And there was a, a theme that he wanted to share. And I ended up incorporating it because I felt it too, just about taking it seriously and doing it for the right reasons. So anyway, I drove out to her house that day because we were going to talk about what needed to be in the forward of the book, the front end, um, before the actual book. And so on the drive out, I talked to this friend in Sacramento, Linda, and she says, yeah, her brother had been died in a motorcycle accident. He had been killed instantly. And she really didn't say anything more than that. She just said she was really suffering. They were so close. So I get to Deborah's house and I'm like, that's kind of ironic. I'm here today because a, um, a co-worker's um, brother just died. And, um, and, she, and Deborah said, well, it's no coincidence because I'm supposed to talk to her. I said, okay, great. And I said, do you want me to call her right now? And she goes, no, let's do what we intended to do first. And then, then we'll do that later. So we went through our stuff and then time was running out. And she said she had to go get, I said, do you want to do the reading now or call her? And she goes, I don't have time to call her right now because I have to go pick up my daughter from school. But let's sit down and see if I can get anything. So she took a pad of paper and a pen, sat down. I sat next to her. And she goes, well, what's, what was the brother's name? I said, I, I don't know. And she goes, what's your friend's name? I said, Linda. And then within a split second, she goes, well, this involved a motorcycle crash and he died instantly. And um, so that much she had told me. So I knew that much was accurate. So theoretically, you could say, okay, that could be telepathy with me. But right. then she went on and had a lot of other information that I knew nothing about, including things like... Um, she saw a red ribbon or red um, banner over his casket. Um, and then she said uh, something about uh, the little kids and bath time. And there were a number, number of different things. But anyhow, on the way home, I, I called Linda up and she said, well, yeah, he, he had these motorcycle buddies who, um, in honor of him at, at his funeral, they had put a red ribbon over his casket. Mm -hmm. And the little kids was an exact phrase they had used for his three children, the little kids, um, because Linda and her husband had raised them for a few years when her brother was battling some addiction problems. And um, the kids, their favorite activity was bath time together with like battle, toy battleships and stuff. So there was a bunch of information that was shared that I knew nothing about. So she couldn't have gotten it from me. So that implies it's either from the spirit of the brother right. or super psi, which is a pretty abstract concept that would just, you know, basically says, you know, clairvoyance has no limits. Um, 
so that's kind of hard to prove or disprove. To me, I think the, mo the more um, simple explanation tends to be the best. And yeah. to me, you know, if if consciousness survives physical death um, and it's still individualized, then the brother was there and given this information in whatever form he may be in, was given this information to Deborah to help the sister and family heal, which it did. Right. I love that you, the way that you explained all of that. Somebody asked me who's, who believes that in what I do. And she said, so how do you, like, do you think that you're talking to dead people? Or do you, I said, look, honestly, I don't know. I mean, it could be parallel dimensions. It could be some kind of uh, like ESP. I haven't heard that term in so long anymore, but, uh, but I said, the only way I know that I'm, that I'm getting it from the other side is the feelings I have um, that I can't explain to you how I know it's real because you're not in my body. Like some, I think it was somebody that sort of criticized, not me personally, but online, it was like, this is, you're faking. And I was like, you can say I'm faking. And all I know, I can't, if you could feel what I'm feeling when it's happening, that's the only, I don't have proof and I don't need to prove it. I just know. I just know. And one of the examples that I recently had a very interesting reading because a lot of times I do my prayer and start to feel energy. I sit down and we're like, all right, let's delve in. Let's figure out who this is here. The minute I, the minute I started meditating, I felt this overpowering energy. Like I had never felt it was like, it took over my whole body. And I was like, Whoa, this person is like super strong. Get on. I said, I feel this, I, mean, I don't remember exactly, but I, I, I knew I was like, this is a romantic partner. She said, yes, my husband in spirit. I knew I was like, oh God, I feel so anxious. Like he's so anxious. And I, I was nervous. I'm like, I feel so nervous. Like I'm afraid to say this because he's having trouble explaining himself to you. And she said, that would be him. I said, he's telling me he has a really hard time apologizing, but he has the biggest apology. She's like, I know exactly why he came in so fast and I gave her so much evidence. And then within like 15 minutes, he was just gone. And that's all I had. Usually I'll go for an hour or an hour and a half with my clients. Cause I like to delve in. And I said, I think I just dropped out. He's just gone. And she said, well, that would be, I said, he just said like, that's all I had to say. I had to tell her I was sorry. She knows what it means. I validated that I was the one flickering the chandelier at Thanksgiving because I said, there's a chandelier flickering. I see everyone at Thanksgiving. She's like, or I said, he said chandelier. She said, yep. We all looked at the chandelier and said, is that you? And so, <laughs> but as soon as he was gone, the energy was gone. It was like, it came in like a storm. As soon as I said what I had to say, I was like sweating and all done. And she said, yep, that would be him. He had a hard time expressing his feelings, which I knew. And then I'm like, he kind of just feels like I don't need to chat. I just wanted to say that and love you. Bye. And then I said, thank God I'm not, you're not paying me. Cause that's all I got. And she's like, that's the question. She said, everything you said was exactly what I've been asking him to answer. That's all it needed to be. But I'm like, if you could have sat there while she was like, oh my God, this is what I've been asking him for. And you could have felt the powerful energy within me. You'd be like, something happened. I don't know what it was but I don't need to know. All I know is something is giving me this information that I just don't have a way of knowing. And it's not a perfect science. And a cynic would go, well, but you weren't exactly right. You got this wrong and you got that wrong because we're always, as mediums, we're sifting through. Okay, I'm not quite sure if this is coming from me or the ads. I'm trying to interpret. It's a whole process and you have to be open to the idea you just have to know that it's not going to be nobody. No, no medium is absolutely a hundred percent perfect with every bit of information. Yeah, because we have this interface. Yes, the interface. <laughs> I love that you said that. And then uh, I, I could, I won't ramble on about that stuff anymore because I could for a year. But the, I wanted to ask you what your relationship with Brandon looks like now, and through the years, how has it looked? Um, you know, I get different experiences from time to time it's not as frequent you know the me i have so many medium friends that will give yeah. me messages here or there just yeah. spontaneously or whatnot um i recently actually served as a test sitter on one of the things that i rarely ever do that i've only done it actually once in all these years because i i just feel i need to stand back there's a reason i did it though and um he came through loud and clear with a lot of good stuff um and then i'll have 
dream visits sometimes. I was going to ask you about visitations. Once in a while. I had, I had a pretty good one last week. Actually, um, my mother-in-law I just saw two nights ago. Um, and I was not expecting her at all, but it was very vivid. And she was smiling and gave me a hug. But um, Brandon, yeah, I'll think about him and feel that rush of energy, you know? Yeah. But I, I pray for him every day, as do I, you know, everyone else that I know and love. Um, but I think about him every day. And I have ever since the day he passed, and I will until I join him, you know? But um, I, we're, I'm in a good place. My family's in a good place. Uh, we understand this is a short ride here. Uh, there's a bigger picture. And, you know, consciousness is not generated by the brain. It's, yeah. it's sifted through the brain. The brain restricts it. Um, hardcore materialistic science has never been able to prove that consciousness is created as an epiphenomenon of the brain. Um, it's primary. Uh, listen to Dr. Evan Alexander and other people. He's a neurosurgeon who had a near-death experience. You probably know who he is. Yes. Um, so if you if you look at that and you look at quantum physics and the um, observer effect, how mind affects matter, you know, it becomes apparent, even though hardcore materialistic scientists are going to keep fighting it till the very end, because yep. their jobs are at stake <laughs> to preserve the status quo. The reality is consciousness is primary physical reality is secondary. So to me, consciousness, it's not only goes on, it, it's independent of the physical body and reality. This is, we're just in a vehicle right now that consciousness is expressed through this body. And when we leave, I suppose, I, can, I don't know exactly, but I suppose it's expressed through your spiritual body, which is a light body um, that goes on. So I, I almost envision it like, okay, um, this is the hardware and consciousness is the software. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's, I just finished uh, recently the book. Is it called Mind Over Matter? It's Dean, is it Dean Radin or Dean Root? How does, it's Dean, Dean Radin. Radin. Yeah. I read, I just read that book, which I, a lot of it, I already kind of knew, but I, it was, it was just sort of a succinct way of putting a lot of these studies into, into little chapters, but it, it, that, that was on my mind, uh, what you were just talking about and how there are scientific studies done and he does talk about how when he would present them science the scientific community would shut it down and and nope that does not fit our paradigm we cannot talk about that mm -hmm. and they literally would i don't know the word but sort of block the information from getting out there well the only reason i bring it up is because even i you know having that analytical mind growing up knowing that this is real somehow and what my dad did was real but not understanding well, where are they you know yeah. Everything's physical right here. We touch it. But then when you when you do learn a little, just basics about quantum physics, you know that everything's just energy and vibration. Yeah. And atoms are 99.99999% empty space. So it's like, okay, this is not what it appears to be. <laughs> right. That's, that's exactly right. I was just going to ask you something. I forget what it was. But um, I guess kind of wrapping up, I would love to hear... Of all of this research, from all of this research that you've done, what's what's something that stands out as something that might have surprised you that you've never thought about, or some major revelation? I'm sure there are millions of them, but uh, can you think of one offhand? Gee, um, well, earlier we talked, and this is a little bit complicated to comprehend or read about, but um, one of the best um, pieces of evidence for survival of consciousness after physical death and um, survival as opposed to the super psi phenomena uh, are called the cross correspondence um, cases and the society of psychical research these are recorded but basically what the reader's digest version of this is that there were a number of partial messages given to a number of different mediums in different locations around the world that tied to a specific deceased person who had been in the SPR um, that made no sense on their own, but when pulled together in aggregate, they made sense. And it, it, it made it clear that there was an intelligence behind how that was done. Ah. So that even goes beyond what I had described earlier with my situation with Deborah. So I'd say the cross correspondence experience uh, cases are, I guess the other thing that I would say is that 
I started this out not only for my own satisfaction, but to try and prove things to skeptics. Mm-hmm. And I'm I no longer care about that. Yeah. Because it's just it's it's a it's a waste of time and energy. I just want to serve the people who need mm-hmm. help and are open. Um, and what you'll find is a lot of folks who either are hardcore atheists are were our hardcore fundamentalists and not open to any of this. If they lose somebody they're close to, be it a spouse or a child, all of a sudden their paradigm shifts and and they're open to looking at new ways of considering things because they're looking for hope, you know? Um, and one thing through helping parents heal in observing the healing process of parents, I kind of developed what I call the five pillars of healing. And that's one of them. You know, I'll briefly tell you what they are. The yeah, first one is that. having support from family or friends. Not everybody has that, but that's helpful if you have it. Number two, support from people who have been through the same thing and relationships develop with them. And that helps a lot. And our organization helps with that because you meet people who are in the same boat. The third thing, the third thing, (laughs) pillar is service. That is to, now not everyone's going to be able to do this right away, but once they've healed enough to do something of service for someone else, or whether it be an organization or just one-on-one, because when you help somebody else, it comes back around and helps heal you too. The fourth pillar is to let go of feelings of guilt and or um, anger, um, hatred towards someone else that you're holding responsible or even yourself. There are cases where I know that would be very, very difficult. I mean, even this case in Texas, you think about how are you going to, how are those families ever going to forgive that 18 year old, you know, but in the meantime, it eats them up. That hatred is hard on them, you know or the feelings of guilt that a parent may have thinking I could have done something and I didn't act that, you know, well, like in my case, was I going to handcuff Brandon and tell him he couldn't, right. you know, you know? Um, and then the last pillar is, you know, the openness to spiritual experiences, discussing afterlife evidence, um, whether that's in a religious form or non-religious form, but just being open to spiritual experiences and to read about near-death experiences, maybe to consider maybe to have a mediumship reading or to learn how to meditate and those things. Um, so those are things I've observed and learned that help people heal, you know, more times than not. Thank you so much for sharing that. I have the same feeling of, I'm not trying to convert anyone. And I said this to that, that man who commented on my, my page, I said, I have no interest in converting, but I share for the, for the, for those for whom it does resonate. Um, And one of my closest, dearest friends, I don't want to put a label on what her, her paradigm was, but she, I, she always thought this was all, she said, Oh, I always thought it was all con artists. And uh, she was more atheistic. I don't want to, she might've called herself agnostic, but I always thought of her as definitely non-believer. And she recently said to me, you know what, because you do this work, I'm a believer now. And I didn't set out to convince her. But through inspiration, she said, I know you well enough to know. Mm -hmm. I've known you for 15 years. And if this is happening to you, it's real. And she said, it's really completely opened my mind. And she still has a healthy skepticism about a lot of things, as do I. I don't want to just, yeah, I think I told her you should have a healthy skepticism. You don't even have to say what it is. But I love, it makes me so happy because she struggles with severe anxiety. And I but yeah. this for me has been like a cure for my anxiety. It's not like I never get anxious, but I'm so much more able to see it as this is earth school. This is happening for a reason. It's all a yeah. lesson. Don't panic. Everything's going to be fine. Your spirit, you have spirit guides. I can talk myself down very quickly and just say, it's fine. It's all part of the, it's all part of it. One thing I heard you say in another, in an interview really resonated because you talked about, I don't know exactly what you said, but what it was you'll probably remember is that I, this is one of my arguments. If you believe in the universe, why is this so out of the, if you look at the stars and the galaxies, it was actually watching uh, that Morgan Freeman documentary uh, through the wormhole or whatever it was. And then watching how the universe works. I don't know which one was his, but um, that actually made me more spiritual because I was like, wait a second. So we're all made of stardust and at any moment, At least our Earth, bodies. yeah, and like our 
this whole world could be sucked into a black hole and like in a second turn into like smaller than the grain of the sand and all of the things that they were talking about. I went, wait, so why are we like that exists? Procreation exists. You can create a human being from like a whole human being, a whole sentient human being with their own thoughts and brains. The human mind has the ability to, to create computers and architecture and buildings and all of these things we take for granted technology. I mean, yes, it's man-made, but the fact that we even had the intelligence to create something like that, we believe so readily in, oh yeah, so two people, you know, they procreate and this baby pops out and we're like, yeah, that's normal, but it's miraculous. And like my mom said once to me, and she's not religious, she's spiritual, but she said, if you ever doubt the existence of God, just look at a flower. And so why are we so resistant to the idea that the consciousness exists outside the body? And you said something like that in something I watched earlier today about the universe. Like, how can we believe in the universe? I don't remember what I said. I don't remember what you said either, but it was something along those lines where I was like, yes, I always say that. Yeah. Well, cool. Like, this is a miracle. Everything, the fact that we're, everything is a miracle, but we just get so, it's so commonplace to us. Yeah. Well, Just, we're tainted. You know, we've yeah. been conditioned to view the world in a through a materialistic lens. Yeah. Um, and and the, the thing is, if you have fundamentalism on one side and you're asked to believe that, that's hard to believe, you know, a lot of that. Um, and then on the other side, you have people trying to tell you that you're, you know, you're nothing. That you live in a chaotic universe. Your life has no meaning. Yeah that doesn't work for me either. <laughs> no. And so. I, yeah, I always say like, if I'm wrong, well, I'd rather believe this. Yeah. It's well, easier. It's I think easier. the truth lies in the middle and your heart knows what's true. I love that. And I, I, I kind of want to end, I'm going to end about here, but I wanted to just have you elaborate one last sort of question is what is it that you want people to know? What's the most important thing you want people to know? that they're here for a purpose, that they have a path and um, see it through, make the most of your life, be happy. You're going to have challenges. You're going to suffer. Suffering can bring growth. Uh, it's hard to get through, but if you can get through that and persist, you'll, you'll finish what you came here to do. And what you came here to do was to refine your soul, to become more than it was when you got here. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing your heart, your vulnerability, your research, your insights, all of it for showing up. It really means the world to me. And I know it means a lot to my listeners and what you're doing is so important for that reason. I mean, if you can get through what you've been through, you never get over it, but you learn to live alongside grief, I think. And the fact that you've done such wonderful work to, to bring hope to other people is so important. And I'm just so grateful for, for you and anyone who's vulnerable enough to share this truth because it can be an unpopular opinion or it can come up against criticism, but what you're doing is beautiful. And thank you so much for sharing what you've learned. Of course, Shannon, it was great to be here and uh, spend the time with you. You take care. Likewise, you too.